in the Bahamas, scenes like this are, unfortunately, all too familiar. Please pray for us. My baby is only four of us, so please. The nation is no stranger to hurricanes and their consequences. This is my apartment. Before Dorian's historic, deadly decimation, they endured major storms in 2015, 2016, and 2017. They know the drill. Clean up the mess, clear away the debris, patch the roofs, and accept a helping hand. These evacuees are waiting for emergency donations of clothing and food at the Nassau office of the Red Cross. It's where I met Matt Merrick, the American Red Cross representative here. You're basically helping the government where it may be lacking in resources or capacity. What it looks like in the beginning is providing immediate assistance in terms of food, water, replacement of household items. We also have a team that's planning for the future. The future, never easy to predict, but especially challenging here and now. So where to begin? Healthcare is right at the top of the list always. On Grand Bahama Island, the challenge is embodied in the story of this place. Freeport's Rand Memorial Hospital, where Dorian's storm surge took a devastating toll. Almost immediately, the whole hospital was inundated with water. That's hospital administrator Sharon Williams. She has worked here for nearly 40 years. She walked us through the one-story facility, wards, the intensive care unit, and the recently upgraded operating suite, all ruined by the saltwater flood. It is heartbreaking. It is very much heart-wrenching. This has been our second home for years. Right now, they are providing care here thanks to help from USAID and relief organizations like Samaritan's Purse and the International Medical Corps. Its volunteer doctors and nurses are seeing patients in tents at the side of a destroyed clinic 30 miles away in High Rock. This woman collapsed after discovering some clothing that belonged to her two grandchildren who were swept away in the storm. Physician Scott Lillibridge is the medical coordinator. He is thinking a lot about what new medical facilities might look like here. For starters, critical needs like ICUs, laboratories, and operating rooms clearly must be built at higher elevations. And you think that the resiliency of a public health system can withstand category five after category five? We know we can't do everything in advance. We can't spend all the money up front, uh, but we can iron in resiliency uh, at every level of planning. Preparedness is an ongoing activity. Uh, we can't tell what's next. We only know that there will be a next. But the government has yet to make clear its intentions. We do know this. It has placed a moratorium on some rebuilding on Abaco so that recovery efforts can be fully planned before everyone just starts doing the same thing again. Meanwhile, people from Abaco don't know whether they are temporary storm evacuees or permanent climate change refugees. We travel to the Kendall Isaacs Gymnasium in Nassau, the largest of a half dozen shelters housing these Dorian evacuees. They don't allow cameras in there. I was able to look in and see the conditions. And they are hard for any shelter. 700 people in this one facility, men, women, and children on mattresses and sleeping bags. It's noisy, it's dirty. And while they supply water and food, that's about it. There's a lot of boredom and a lot of frustration and a lot of anger about what's next for this community. Out front, I met Shella Monestine, whose baby was born a day before Dorian hit and who expects to return to Abaco, although her physical home is gone. Because that's where you used to live, so automatically you won't go back. Home is home. Home is home. Actually, most of the people now, they don't even want to stay in there. Everybody trying to go. But they can't go right now because too much damage. But to me, I really don't want to be in there. With this, my young baby, I really don't want to be in there. But I ain't got no choice to be in here because nowhere else to go. 
Most of the people here are undocumented Haitians who have been living in the Marsh Harbor slum called the Mud for decades. So these refugees have no home and no country. In fact, the government is threatening to deport many of them. But this is not a narrative the government is interested in sharing with the world. We made our way down to the waterfront in Nassau, where massive cruise ships are again lined up in the untouched harbor, monstrosities of grandeur looming over the overcrowded evacuation shelters in their shadow. The future of the Bahamas, the success of the recovery, depends on this big pink building and others like it to convince the world that the Bahamas is open for business and that all that death and destruction and those bodies, that's a different Bahamas. There is no shame in these opposing narratives. Both are true. Recovery for the Bahamas is dependent on a steady stream of visitors. After all, 60% of its economy is related to tourism. But what will a rebuilt Abaco and Grand Bahama look like? Some of the best minds in the Bahamas are starting to imagine this. Alison Maynard Gibson is a former member of parliament, minister of finance, and attorney general. How are you thinking about the future of parts of the Bahamas? I hope that we don't just simply carry on business as usual, bricks and mortar, let's rebuild, and all of that. I, I hope that we take the opportunity, to, it's very complex, to bring experts together from all over the world, climate change experts, academia, NGOs, governance experts. We should be able to come together as a people and have a plan for what our country should look like. The new question that Dorian raises here is whether to rebuild. Seeing the devastation, it's hard to imagine what can be done in the face of climate change. Valeria Flax is at the center of this planning. She is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of the Bahamas. Are you optimistic that your country can address this in time? I am optimistic that it will happen. Um, I guess it's hard to imagine not there being another option than for us to have some way of resilience, some way of bouncing back. I hope that whatever decisions are made are the right decisions for the country moving forward um, so that we have some idea of how we're going to move forward to face the climate change issues that we're, we're going to have. The truth is there will be more hurricanes and they will be bigger and stronger and they will hover longer. And today that debate is wide open in the Bahamas. The debate between the country that the Bahamas once was and the one it needs to become to adapt to climate change. The beautiful aquamarine sea that surrounds the Bahamas is a two-edged sword for this island nation. It sustains it, and now it also poses a clear and present threat. For my radar, I'm Juliette Kayyem in the Bahamas. <laughs>